Welcome back to the Brothers War EDH. I'm back at it again here with Chris and Blake. What's going on, boys? How y'all doing? I'm doing wonderful. Um, coming off of a beautiful weekend. Um, and also, Blake was in town last week. Got to enjoy a little bit of Blake time. That's why, you know, our scheduling has been a little off as far as the podcast is concerned. But, you know, I'd rather spend some good one-on-one -on -one time with Blake than, uh, you know, that's why we're called the Brothers War. Right. Ah, and that makes one of us. Wow. Yeah. One sided. Very one sided well. love. Okay. One sided love. All right. It's all right. all right. It's all right. I feel the love. I feel the love. Well, before we begin uh, with our discussion for today, I just want to ask you to please subscribe to the channel, y'all. Uh, we are at, I think it's like 960 subs now. We're 40 away from our monetization goal. Uh, and we're so close. Uh, you know, just thank you if you if you're already subbed. We really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Um, you know, your subs and your likes and comments uh, really help us out. It goes a long way, and we want to continue to do our best for y'all on this channel. With all that being said, we are going to go ahead and go into our discussion for today. A lot of y'all have been asking about this specific topic uh, since we we briefly brought it up in a previous video. But uh, it is about mulligans. It's going to be all about mulligans. Just our tips on what, on what we recommend y'all do besides just doing it more, you know? Because it's one of the most uh, important things you can do as a Magic player. It's also one of the most broken things you can do. So before we get into that, what are y'all's initial thoughts uh, on mulligans in general and the current, uh, the, the current EDH landscape? The theme of this episode is going to be utilize the broken mulligan system. We'll go over what the mulligan system looks like in Magic the Gathering, especially in Commander. Um, and ultimately, people do not do it often. They find a hand that they think is playable, um, and then they keep it because it has lands in it. Um, they can play a spell maybe on turn two, turn three, uh, and then maybe draw into something. In today's magic, that is not really going to propel you to win games that often. It could. Um, however, it depends really on kind of like what power level you're playing at. So yeah, that's what I think overall. Yeah, I would echo the sentiment. I think one of the biggest things that people, I guess, screw up with mulligans is like you said, they look for the minimum functional hand that they can find when the mulligan system, especially under the new uh, London mulligan, allows you to look for a significantly better hand. And what I mean by that is when I look at a hand, I think, can I propel myself to the front of the group with this hand? If not, I'm pretty likely to mulligan. At the bare minimum, and we'll get into this more, is I think one of the things you really need to be looking for is in your mulligans are engines not only you know lands and spells but actual like engines because nowadays in today's landscape of edh is you really win via engines and producing more resources than the others and if your opening hands don't have that you're basically forced to hope that rng is going to carry you to the win let's just go over uh just really quick um you know what the mulligan is right now uh because you just mentioned uh the london mulligan so uh in edh when you begin the game you know you draw you draw your seven if you don't if you don't like your seven you have the option to put it back and then have one free mulligan which you can be able to uh you know shuffle draw seven if you like that you know you get to keep it it's free you don't have to do anything else so then after that uh you you then begin uh the london mulligan so you draw the second seven you don't, uh, and let's say you don't like that seven. So now what you do is you put those cards back, you shuffle, then you draw another seven, and then you, you pick and choose one to put back. And then every mulligan after that, uh, you're drawing seven, and then you put one more additional card back. So then the next one, you would put two back. The next one, you would put three back, uh, and so, uh, so on and so forth. So yeah, that's basically uh, the, current, the current mulliganing uh, system. And, uh, you know, y'all mentioned that people, that people don't mulligan enough. Uh, what do you think uh, are 
some common uh, traps for people not mulliganing just in general. Because I mentioned previously, uh, I want I wanted the previous podcast that that for me a long time ago, one of the things that that kind of scared me was like having enough lands in my hand to where I can like you know have a land drop at least to turn three or four. I kind of didn't really look at like the other spells that I had. I would keep a hand that was like three lands, and then I would just be happy that I was able to play lands. What are some common things that, that people kind of fall into to where they don't take mulligans and they just keep whatever hand they have? I think specifically one of the things you need to, that needs to be specific is I do think mulliganing for 60 card formats is different than mulliganing for 100 card formats. Because I think a lot of people mulligan EDH hands like they mulligan 60 cards where you're mostly looking for lands and spells that are castable, all your colors, and at that point you can execute your game plan. Since we are at a, since we're in a 100 card singleton format, not all of those cards are built for those scenarios, and we have more like uh, engine cards, late game cards, like more niche cards. And the beauty of the London Mulligan that recently came in with Corset 2020 is that not only that you basically get to see more cards, the uh, based on your mulligan. So instead of having to only draw up to six or only draw up to five and get the scry, you actually get to look at seven every single time and put back the ones you don't want. So you can actually be extremely selective in sculpting your hand. Now the overall volume of it goes down, but you can make a much better hand with that. Yeah, I think um, some things that people might fall into, and I don't even know if it's like pitfalls or traps, but just some things that could stray away people from mulliganing are uh, the, the ability or the, the, the fact that they have to shuffle every time. Um, London Mulligan, you have to shuffle, if you don't like the hand, you have to shuffle your hand back into your library and then draw a new seven. Um, and, you know, sometimes people don't like to do that too often. If they find a hand that is like playable, keepable, um, not really not keepable, but, uh, more playable, then they'd be more happy to, uh, keep that hand rather than put their hand back and shuffle up again and then draw another seven that they don't know will actually have lands or, you know, or stuff to cast. So, uh, shuffling is, a uh, is definitely a deterrent. So like, how do you say that? I would have never <laughs> like I, I, me myself, I would never think of it like that, but I've definitely, now that you say that and thinking about it, I've been in multiple pods where they're like, this isn't great, but I don't want to waste your guys' time with more shuffling and that sort of thing. So uh, that is, yeah. that is definitely a true like thing I've experienced in, in person, but never really thought about until you just said that. It's like a, it's like a social like slash inconvenience reason. That's yeah, that you're wasting everybody's time because you're having to mulligan. When I think really, I, f at least for me personally, I actually think it's the opposite. If you keep a suboptimal hand to where you can't like function, I actually think it makes for an overall worse game experience. It's just yeah. Yeah. funny to think about. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I do want to touch on that, the mental part of it. Maybe people don't really want to think about the mulligan as much. And it's probably because they uh, they they like don't know what they're looking for, or they're like, okay, well, if I have like X amount of lands, and then I have some spells, you know, it's okay. Because I think that they probably go into the game and they're like, okay, well, eventually I can cast these cards, uh, but as long as long as I don't have one land, or I've definitely done this before in my life where I kept like a, a five lander, and I'm like, oh yeah. I can drop these lands, you know, five turns in a row. I, I can play nothing but lands and I'm not going to fall behind in tempo. And then, you know, I end up having nothing while I'm getting destroyed by someone else. And it didn't really matter at that point that I had five lands because I can't, I can't freaking do anything. So. Yeah, I think that's a common pitfall for sure. But it, uh, one thing that struck me, what you said is how people don't take mulligans like that seriously, which is funny because I think, that's absolutely true, but I think if you look at, like, all of the game actions throughout the entire game, I think deciding on the starting hand is one of probably the most important decisions you can make in a game, funnily enough. And I think a lot of people don't take it as seriously as they should. Yeah. They don't take it seriously, and it seems like they don't even really think about it or try to adopt that skill as part of how they play their deck because, you know, they... 
they goldfish and they're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, my deck, you know, my deck's doing great right now. But being able to have the skill of, of like, okay, well, what are the kinds of opening hands that will help me get to where I want to be faster than everyone else? And I know people, you know, watching this are probably gonna be like, oh, well, here they go again with all this speed talk, you know, but that's the thing though, is that you do want to get to your, your game plan uh, as as quickly as possible. And, you know, it doesn't mean play decks that are just very, very fast, but it's like you want to have hands that it's actually going to get you to your game plan. It's not really about like fast hands more than it is about hands that, that will get you to your game plan. I think in the, the casual list of games, mulligans are still important because, again, it doesn't matter if you're trying to play your whole hand or, you know, win on turn one or turn ten. If your hand doesn't, like... If, you, if your starting hand doesn't start with some sort of game plan or some sort of engine to accrue resources, it doesn't matter if you're CEDH or, you know, level one casual. You're not going to have a great time unless you just get extremely lucky off the top. But why do that when we literally have a system in the game that says these cards aren't good at the time that I am or the time that I'm going to have them. So let me throw them all back and look at seven more. I think then that's why I don't think a lot of people do enough of mulliganing because they really truly can increase your win percentage by a huge amount if you're truly applying the thought process that we're talking about here you know it, it can probably be a part of just one of those skills that people should adopt you know and that's why that's why we, we're here talking about this today because i feel like that no one really talks about it no one talks about it enough they don't really like go through examples but it's kind of hard to go to go through examples because everyone's deck is different just what the deck does you know the curves might be different uh game plans are different so it's just something that everyone one for for each one of their decks they should be adopting for each one of the decks because it's gonna be different for every deck so one pitfall that i also wanted to add and it's funny because you know i was just talking talking about about like speed i think that like a lot of people they see you know the fast mana um and they're like and like, oh man i got my soul ring i got like this this other fast mana they might have like one or two lands but then they have like no no engines at all their commander is also not an engine. And they're just like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm going to keep this hand because I can dump out all of these mana rocks, but they have no way to like draw cards. And then they're, they're basically going into like top deck mode, trying to find something that, that can draw them more cards. So one thing that I recommend uh, for sure is just because you have, you know, fast mana in your hand, you got to look at the other cards. And so a good example of this was in the gameplay that we did for Thanksgiving, where I won with Sai. Uh, my opening hand was a Buried Ruin, Fierce Guardianship, Rhystic Study, Moonsnare Prototype, uh, a Chrome Mox, a Mana Vault. You know, you could say that this hand, it's like, Ryan, why in the freaking world are, are, you, are you keeping this hand? Well, I had turn one Rhystic Study, and that was kind of like the thing. And, you know, obviously, if you watch that gameplay, I didn't do it right. I was so greedy that I ended up not even playing the game correctly. So. Because I was like, man, I got a fierce guardianship to back up someone trying to destroy my risk study. Let's go. And it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't supposed to work that way. You know, the risk in there would be the fact that my only land in the hand was one that created only, only colorless mana. Uh, but besides that, you know, turn one risk study is, uh, it's is pretty powerful. And, you know, the risk reward, uh, in general regarding like, okay, well, I can keep this one land hand and the reward would just need to be so good, which in this case is, was my turn one risk study, but would y'all have kept that hand? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, snap basically it, yeah, at, at any power level, even playing it correctly, I think you keep it as, you know, turn one risk study is such a, again, if I, you, you can't preach what we're not going to follow. That is like one of the better engines in blue, especially in a more casual game. I'm keeping that. Yeah. Yeah. And also your turn one, uh, your player one in turn order. So like the, the chance that you were going to get at least one card was very high. Yeah. That's even more, more reason to keep it if you're fucking, uh, uh, player one absolutely right let's segue into kind of like in, into kind of like some of the uh you know the thought processes that like you know we should be considering so let's so let's start from the very beginning what are some things that we should be considering just in the very beginning so like you know we all sit down at the table and what are some things that like we, we should think about before we go into looking at our hand 
Well, I think your your last example was a great representation of the segue into this question because turn order is very, very uh, important when you're thinking about mulligans. If you're player one, you are more likely to take a riskier, uh, greedier option like the Ristic Study Hand that you had because the chances that you're able to get cards and benefit off those engines are very high. Um, some things that you want to look for, obviously, we, Blake mentioned it at the very beginning, uh, setting up a value engine as early as turn one, very important, or as early as you can get it. Um, even if you just have a value engine in your hand, very, very important, uh, and significantly increases the chance that you're going to keep that hand. Um, obviously, you, wanna, you want lands. You want at least one or two lands, uh, depending, and maybe even more depending on the power level of the table that you're sitting in. Um, and then, of course, you also uh, want to consider what kind of decks you're playing against and what kind of decks that you are and what, what deck that you're playing. Uh, for instance, is your commander a value engine? Is your commander not a value engine? That's going to change the and affect the way that you mulligan. If your commander is a value engine, you're going to look for other things and you're not going to look for necessarily Ristic studies, but you might be looking for uh, fast mana so you can turbo out that commander since it's a value engine. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can consider, um, even your game plan, the way that you, your decks, uh, kind of tend to be as far as like, are you leaning more into an aggressive strategy, a turbo strategy, a mid range strategy, control strategy, regardless of the strategy. I really think that the number one thing that you need to prioritize is setting up a value engine. Um, so that is the, probably the biggest thing that you want to, that you want to look for. Um, and then of course you can kind of go into the nuances of like what your decks how your deck uh, plays against your opponent's decks. Like if you know, oh, my deck is really bad against this deck, it completely shuts off my deck. You might want to look for more removal in your opening hand. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, however, I think that uh, the more you practice at it, the better you get. You kind of form a little bit of like your strategy and the way that you mulligan uh, through experience. I would tend to agree. And definitely to Chris's point, it definitely matters what commander you're running so like for example in my jun tokens deck basically the entire deck runs around tokens whether it's using them to generate mana using them to draw cards so whatever the case may be I, my opening hand has to have some sort of generator um because the commander itself is five mana and i like to be doing more things than waiting till five mana so but all of the entire deck is basically built around abusing tokens in some shape, form, or matter. So if I don't have a generator, the deck's in a much worse spot. So that's one of the key things I'm looking for in an opening hand. I really like how uh, we're kind of trying to encourage people to think not only just about just about their deck and their game plan, but also what's going on across across the table uh, with other people. Because you know, honestly, I don't think that like that like a lot of people even think about that when they when they choose uh when they choose their hands. It's why having you know like a rule zero conversation in the very beginning, trying to trying to like gauge uh you know kind of like the strength of people's decks and like what what people's decks do. Because honestly, that's like free information in the very beginning that can help you uh, on whether or not you want to maybe keep the hand that you have so there's just more factors out there than just oh well i'm playing this strategy and i should be getting these kinds of cards it should be that in addition to like what right. chris said uh turn order if your commander is like a value engine or just you know just just in general like you know what kind of decks other players are playing you might be playing against decks that your deck probably fares a lot better than uh compared to them against yours so you could probably keep you know, potentially, uh, you know, maybe like riskier hands in that case. And, you, and you're just like, oh, well, you know, their, their strategies probably don't really affect me that much. So I probably don't need to worry about maybe keeping uh, protection in my hand or, or, or whatever. You can just find hands that could probably just get to, to your game plan just very, very fast without really considering them. So we talked about, you know, the things that, that you should look for. Uh, you know, before the game, but kind of like our recommendations for what you should be looking for um, when you mulligan. I wanted to take this opportunity to kind of uh, to kind of show some examples, and we can do this because uh, you know you know we can be able to look at at the deck list that we have. So uh, you know the you know the first example that I gave uh, was was with Sai, even though it wasn't something where it's like oh well my game plan can be able to get very uh, you know can be able to get there quickly 
based on the based off of the cards in my hand, it was more like okay, well, turn one risk study was was the play for this. So uh, I wanted to go uh, with each of y'all and just go into Moxfield, go into one of your decks, and we're just gonna go through uh, an opening hand and kind of see based off of everything that like we just talked about if it is something that you would keep or throw away. So. Uh, Chris, we'll start with you. Uh, we have uh, your your Pia deck, uh, the Exile Matters deck, or in this case, uh, as you called it, the well, the Domain Expansion Exile Infinite deck. If you know, you know. <laughs> such, a, such a weeb. <laughs> so here's Chris's hand. A Mox Amber, a Chrome Mox, Emeria's Call, Blind Obedience, Curse of Hospitality, a Deflecting Swat, and a soul fire eruption. Chris, you will be. Uh, we'll we'll give you turn uh, turn two. Uh, you are second in turn order. What do you think about this hand? Uh, what 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 power level are we playing at? Uh, let's say I, let's say you're your mid power. I guess we're yeah okay mid power. Okay, so uh, understanding that I'm kind of like in a mid power range, uh, I, I realize that I have a little bit more time. Um, however, uh, this hand it's got. A lot of things that I need. He is uh, is a two mana card. Um, so Boros for a two three. Thopters are control of haste. Whenever I play a land from exile or cast a spell from exile, I'll create a one one Thopter. So the importance of Pia is to get her out early, and then using her to churn out Thopters and using those Thopters uh, to win the game effectively. So uh, when we look at our Mulligans, it's going to kind of uh, revolve around that kind of thesis. So what we have here is we have two zero mana rocks. We have one land which is Amiria's Call. Uh, Curse of Hospitality, which is one of my engines. Um, not only a card advantage engine, but also an engine for Pia to exile and cast from the uh, my opponent's libraries. We have Protection uh, in Deflecting Swat. We have a little bit of one-sided stacks, and then we have a, a massive exile spell, which isn't really relevant right now, but it's, uh, it's definitely something um, there. Uh, so the th this hand right here, if I'm player two, Definitely keeping this hand. I'm going turn one Amaria's Call uh, into uh, turn one Chrome Mox, exiling probably the Soulfire Eruption because I'm probably not casting that for a long time. Uh, and then casting a Mox Amber. So what I have here is I've opened up my possibility to keep the, the protection with Deflecting Swat. I've also opened up the opportunity to cast a Curse of Hospitality on turn two and start effectively churning through my XL. I'm definitely snap keeping this. Would there be a world uh, where you play the the blind obedience on turn one? Um, I don't think so. Uh, depends. If I'm playing CDH, probably. Uh, but even then, um, this table, this 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 deck can't can't uh, can't perform well in the CDH setting. I don't think okay. so. Uh, I probably won't bring this to a CDH table. Okay. But uh, high power, mid power, definitely going to keep this hand. I probably won't play a blind obedience on turn one. Probably won't play it on turn two either. Again, another thing that you want to think about with mulligans is the sequencing of your play. So, like, oh, when you look at your hand, what am I doing the first couple turns? Uh, so, yeah, you have to really look at that as well and kind of evaluate based off of your hand that you're looking at. Yeah, which is pretty good. And then you open it up. Uh, you know, you have you have Mox Amber, which you can be able to to automatically use that. You know, in case you're you're able to get something out there, you got the SWAT, which uh, you know turns free with with uh the turn one pso it's definitely you know it's definitely a keeper i think when i first saw this hand i was you know i, I looked at it and i was like i was like oh well there's only there's only one land uh you know you know it's one, important to know one you, can, land. you can play you can play lands off curse of hospitality too mm -hmm. once you play one land off of that you'll get a thopter you still have protection from deflecting swat so you can dodge one removal i mean if you get two removal you're probably stuck but it's not likely um yeah. but before turn three and then by that time you're already dealing two damage with the thopter or you're already uh, doing uh two instances of damage getting two exiles off curse of hospitality this isn't even counting the top decks that you're already drawing from your just starting your turn so yeah and it's also something something uh to be aware uh as well i fall into into the chapter a lot you don't want to like get into a mindset where it's like oh well someone could like easily mess me up and then and then I'll be stuck so because like you know this hand well for one you get deflecting swat which you know like like what Chris just said you dodge one piece of removal which is which is really good but you know I I probably wouldn't get into the mindset where it's like oh well 
you know, what if I don't draw any more lands or, you know, what if someone deals with, with, with my stuff, you know, and I'll, and I'll be done. Like, it's why it's important to, to really understand your deck. You don't want to be scared of like what other people might do. If you know that your hand is good enough to where you could be able to get to where you want to go. So that's just something. The, the, ce the ceiling on this hand is high and also the floor is, is pretty high as well. Uh, I mean, you, when you think about, you know, you can't really evaluate hands based off of, uh, unless you, unless it's like your com the commanders you're going against, uh, you can't really evaluate them on, oh, what if my commander dies? What if, you know, I mean, it could very well happen. You could do that with any deck though. Like you can right. make that case for any deck. What if, what if my plan is disrupted? You know what I mean? That's just going to happen in Magic the Gathering. So uh, you really have to just continue to think about, oh, what are my sequence of plays? And how am I going to uh, enact that? So Blake, we're going to look at one of your decks. Uh, we are going to look at Hilda of the Icy Crown. This one is a very, very interesting one. Uh, we are going to put you at turn number four. So you'll be going last. And uh, you said that this was a kind of like a mid uh it kind of like a mid deck maybe like a six if you if you look at the at the power level scale it's probably going to end up around like a six your opening hand is going to be a polluted delta hammers of, of morden uh an offer you can't refuse you see a guard approach reality shift cryptic command illithid harvester yep yep so this is your opening hand Okay, so looking at this hand, first thing I notice is we only have one land. Um, we have Hammers of Moradin, which is a mid-game tapper, uh, counterspell, a tap or uh, protection instant, a removal spell, counterspell, and one. Uh, you've got my multiple tapper, or uh, it also functions as kind of a board wipe. Um, so in this deck specifically is a really extremely based around the commander um, because tapping things is not the strongest strategy. It's only really a tempo play, but she turns those taps into additional resources. So I am trying to rush into her if possible, or at least um, having a bit more early presence until I get to her. And I think this hand doesn't do a lot of that it's mostly reactive and with no engine and one land i'm throwing this back and looking at another sub okay i agree all right so let's let's go ahead and just and, and just do that so you're taking your free mall you're taking yeah, your free mall all right your second hand ancient oh, tomb. Just won't go away <laughs> yeah it's gonna be second ancient tomb I... flaws to maneuver hammers of morden <laughs> gadwick the wizen um opposition Junkwinder and Sheree of Numbing Depths. So this is a, a much better hand than the last one in the sense that Opposition is hands down the best card in the deck. It is... Mm. Uh, Junkwinder is the second best card in the deck. Um, Love but it. you have a colorless land uh, and that's it. <laughs> so I... You can't, unfortunately, cannot keep this, but it is quite a good hand otherwise. Yeah, this, this is a man, the this power is a snap, of lands. Snap, uh, so, snap, snap, snap to six. Yeah, I, we're going to six. All right, we're going to six. All right, Oof. all right. Okay. So, all right, uh, this one right here, polluted delta. This is why you, mul this is why you <laughs> mulligan guys. Pretty good, pretty good hand yeah. here. So, in this scenario, yeah. oh, oh, here, here, gonna... here. let me read them off real quick. Uh, yeah, yeah, I yeah. will say player four kind of hurts this, but uh. Play yeah. for does hurt this, but that's fine. All right, so yeah. so this is this is your hand where you keep only six. Blue Delta, mm -hmm. Prismatic Vista, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Esper Sentinel, Toppelgeist, Giga Drowse, Will Breaker, and Abishan, Cephalid Emperor. Okay, so this is a much better hand, and I I'm much happier with this six than I am with my first or second seven. Um so definitely benefit to mull down to six here. Uh, obviously, we've got the two lands. We have 
one of the better draw engines in the deck, being Esper Sentinel. Toppelgeist is an initial tapper when it enters the battlefield, but once you have Delirium, it'll tap on everybody's turn. So it's actually one of your better tappers um, once you get to more of a mid-game scenario. Giga Drows is a replicate tapper instant. Willbreaker is for taking things, and Cephalid taps all the creatures, so you get a multitude of taps here. So the card I'm throwing back here is probably going to be um, the Cephalid in this scenario, as we are currently low on lands and he is not only six mana but also requires three mana to activate so he's more of an end game um he's an end of the game play him activate him it taps everybody's board for each person that for each creature that got tapped you get to make a four four so i can on the end of my turn with all my mana active tap everybody's stuff down make 10 four fours untap and attack everyone and kill them so he doesn't need to be here right now so we're throwing him back and keeping the rest of the six this deck looks kind of sick honestly i'm waiting to see it oh uh, yeah i would <laughs> it looks it looks really fun to uh to play against all right so last uh i'll do one as well uh we're gonna look at my seton uh crows and protector deck uh it's my druid ball deck so um something about this deck before you know you know if i were to go into the game uh let's say uh oh, oh, okay so, so uh, y'all give me um uh a turn order spot let's go turn three yeah all right turn three uh okay and this deck um it's I would say it's pretty mid. It might be like a little, a, a little more than mid. Uh, you know, if you were to give it a number, it'd probably be like a seven. Maybe it's not. It's it's not insane, but it's not. It's not like slow, right? And but some things about my deck is that this is probably one of those things where I do ha have to keep in mind the other the, the other players. So if I knew that I was playing against um, against decks that probably uh you know can control the board very well like you know may maybe like heavy board wipe because you know if i get wiped out my game plan is pretty much gonna be over because like you know, it's like I'm, I'm just trying to <laughs> i'm yeah yeah it's like it's like you know i gotta be, i gotta be mindful of those but i got two forests one village elder uh, a heritage druid a mass vandal an incubation druid and uh a guilt leaf arch druid so uh just off the bat uh you know you know i could technically use the mass vandal as uh as an elf for heritage druid i do have uh you know a, a card uh, a card advantage engine with guilt leaf arch druid which is like and this card is like probably like one of the one of the best cards in the deck i think that i would keep this and it's okay that 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 my lands are like a bit low because you know you know i'm a druid ball deck and seton just makes a crazy amount of mana and yeah like you know people could deal with with with, with my board but i think that I, that I that i would be cool with taking this hand in conclusion uh you know we hope that we're, we're able to shed some light uh on on just mulligans in general uh number one do it a lot more it's just something that is a part of the game that um if you were to to practice it a lot more it could give you an edge you know just like what what we talked about before with like you know uh you know building your decks with the right amount of like lands and stuff like that it's stuff like this that can really that can really elevate your game um and you know it forces you to actually think you know that's one of the biggest things we want people to do on this channel is to actually Think a lot more about the things uh in this game to give them uh more of an of an advantage compared to those that you know just want to just kind of just uh just go with the flow and not and not and not really think so yeah there's nothing you, wrong with that yeah 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 the, the, there's nothing Depends wrong with on that. What, what you want out of the game right 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 but you but know if you're trying to level up yeah, yeah if, you're, if trying you're trying to, to level up sure if you're trying to take your skill bigger game to the next level, definitely adopt a lot of these uh, little level up moments. I will say, in the mo for the most part of it, when anybody plays any game, you know, the, obviously there is a level of, you know, hanging out with your friends and stuff, but you right. are also trying to usually win and win that game. Right, right. For the most part. Beginning off, 
you know, the game before you even look, you even look at your hand, you want to see, you know, you want to scope the, you know, you want to scope the table, you know, you've already had your, your rule zero talks, see what's, see what's going on there. Um, understanding your deck is very important. Uh, because you know you want to see what you're trying to look for, and then when you actually go into into keeping your hands, and if you don't like it, just know just know what what you're looking for to get to your game plan. You're pretty much gonna be just fine. Practice, you know, just just practice mulliganing. I mean, you know, I, I've done this a lot of times. Just just go into Moxfield and like what and like what what we just did. Just scroll all the way down. Hit the uh, you know hit hit the button to just redraw hands, and just see and just see which ones um, you know would be good keeps, which ones would be bad keeps. Just understand your deck, and that's really uh, the best uh, that that we can tell y'all as far as mulligans. Um, if y'all have any uh, any any other thoughts on um, on the mulligan system, you know, and any other tips that like you that that like, you want to share as well. Uh, please let us know in the comments uh, below. We'd love to hear from y'all on that. But uh, with that being said, do y'all have anything else y'all want to share today? My only thing I want to say is to take advantage of the Linden Mulligan. Uh, it's a broken Mulligan rule. Um, you're able to look at 14 cards for free and then even upwards to 21 to 28. Uh, looking at a fourth of your deck before you choose, you know, a select few up to five, six, seven. So just consider that you're going to be looking at a lot of cards. Um, and remember that, you know, the more cards you see, the higher chance you have to win. Don't settle for mediocre hands when you can very easily use the mulligan rule to set yourself up for success. Y'all, we hope y'all had a wonderful time with us today. Uh, please remember uh, to subscribe to the channel, to uh, like the video, share it with your friends, you know, you know, you know, communicate with us, you know, uh, we'll have a, we'll have a, a link in the, the description for our discord. If you want to connect with us on there, uh, I also want to take a moment to shout out our patrons as well. Brian Chambers, Drew Garth, J gigs, the crew, uh, you know, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for a fourth person to pop up. Yeah. <laughs> join, <laughs> join the ranks. Thank you patrons for supporting us every single month. Uh, and I also just want to thank everyone else for all the support that you have for our channel. Uh, you know, we're trying to hit a thousand subs by the end of the month uh, to end 2023. Hitting that goal would be amazing. So we're also on TikTok too. A link will be in the description below. You know, kind of popping off on TikTok a little bit. I, I kind of like that. But anyways, like but anyways, uh, with that being said, uh, we are the Brothers War. We hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time.